Um, my name is Rick Brosson. I'm a research professor here at UVM. And um, I've been given the great honor of uh, chairing the, this morning's session. Uh, and to kick off the session, we have a really uh, great opportunity to get perspective on these issues of contingency management and the implementation of contingency management uh, direct from the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, our first presenter, who is familiar to many of us for, for her uh, years of work at NIDA, I think she was my project officer on several of my grants. Steve said she was project officer on his grants. Uh, it, it, our speaker is Cece McNamara, who's a senior policy analyst in the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, she provides policy analysis and, and is the main, one of the main content experts for the director and chief of staff for uh, issues on drug policy. Uh, and for those of us who are out in the wandering around and, and looking at trying to figure out policy and figure out exactly what can be influenced, CC is the person we always call to ask questions on uh, practical issues because she has a tremendous grasp of the science because of her background as a researcher herself and her time at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. But she also now, with her 10 years at the Office of National Drug Control Policy, I think she's been through three directors now of at ONDCP, she sort of understands how the gears of the government work and how policy gets morphed into uh, practice and services. So it's a really great honor. Um, she was uh, she received her clinical research training in psychology at the University of New Mexico and at the University of Alabama. She was a professor at the University of Alabama, and she's done a lot of work with uh, disadvantaged populations, uh, people who use uh, cocaine and crack, uh, people without housing, and uh, really is a person who both knows our field from the, the individuals we serve and the policies that are involved with our practices, as well as the science behind those practices or the absence of science behind those practices. So uh, it's my, she is uh, able to do the presentation today uh, over Zoom. And so we will hear from Cece now. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for that really kind introduction. And um, I also want to thank Steve, uh, Dr. Higgins, and all of the um, staff at Vermont for making this important uh, meeting possible. Next slide, please. I'll be speaking today about federal agency actions. And um, I want to go through some of the things that have been published that relate to uh, contingency management. Uh, there's a number of documents that ONDCB has um, had vetted throughout the interagency and has had a great deal of stakeholder input to. And um, there's three that have been published. The ONDCP first year priorities, uh, which we were congressionally required to publish within the first year of the new administration within 90 days. The National Drug Control Strategy, which is our um, you know, our main congressional requirement that sets out the policy, drug policy for an administration. And um, that was vetted by over 2,000 external stakeholders, ranging from governors to state health officials, members of Congress, researchers, people with lived experience. Uh, and I want to call your attention to two issues that were new in the National Drug Control Strategy uh, this administration. One was harm reduction, and the other was equity. So having this conference um, focused on particular issues related to underserved populations is really important. And then um, the ONDCP methamphetamine plan was uh, published in partial response to the Methamphetamine Act of 2021, um, which was signed into law by the president on March 14th of 2022. But it also is an attempt uh, to try to organize and, um, and influence policy in this area where, um, I mean, this was started well before the law passed, um, in this area where there seems to be real, real need 
uh, an enormous need for more, um, more of a response related to the growing methamphetamine problem. Next slide, please. So ONDCP and HHS and the VA recognize that contingency management therapy is one of the best treatments available for treating stimulant use disorder. And when I say that, I mean both cocaine and methamphetamine use disorder. As Rick mentioned, I have experience using this treatment related to people who are homeless, related to uh, crack cocaine use, uh, as well as related to alcohol use. Um, but there is lack of an FDA-approved medication to to treat stimulant use disorder. So contingency management for this condition is a priority to the administration. Next slide, please. And I just wanna say for those of you who are concerned about how um, slowly things seem to, to move, um, one thing that is important to recognize is that when we have a, an administration transition, we have a lot of education to do. So we have been working on um, educating different people across the administration about this therapy. People in the VA who have already scaled up contingency management have been very integral to that process. And um, when you think about it, we are trying to influence a, a large, large number of, of staff and individuals across the federal government. Um, whenever we take on a new initiative like this. So the methamphetamine plan, there is an action item in there right now that we're currently working on. This was ONDCP is leading an interagency process to address policy barriers that ONDCP staff and others across the interagency have identified that prevent successful implementation of contingency management for appropriate addiction treatment, including consideration of issues related to reimbursement authority, digital therapeutics, grant funding limit, and legal liability and fraud. And this lists some of the uh, agencies that are involved in, um, in the um, action item. So uh, just a little bit of a how policy works inside baseball type of thing. ONDCP oversees the, um, the budget related to drug policy at agencies that do drug policy related work. So um, you may not see every agency on there, but if they have a budget um, and they have some um, stake in this, then they will be, um, they'll be included in an action item in a, in a policy document that we write. And I do want to go and say that um, also my background is in psychology um, as a, a researcher and a clinician. Um, when I got my PhD in psychology at UNM, I don't think there were any policy classes that were available. And um, I think if anyone is there and they have um, you know, an opportunity to influence curricula for upcoming psychologists, behavior analysts, having a background in policy can be really, really helpful. And I've gotten on the job training in the past 10 years, but I literally did not have any of this when I was at NIDA. So um, I think this is a, an excellent opportunity um, and people who are interested in doing this type of work should really look for opportunities uh, where they can learn from others and become engaged in it. Because I do agree with Steve when he spoke yesterday and mentioned that advocacy was going to be one of the ways to change the field. I think advocacy is really important. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. We've kind of broken up the, um, the work related to this into cross department um, and then HHS related work. And I believe we're gonna hear from another speaker today about some of the HHS related, um, related work, but the um, ONDCP has a work group. It involves the drug budget agencies that do have um, a stake in this. And one of the agencies that we hadn't been working with on this issue at all previously was Treasury and, um, well, Department, Treasury, um, and underneath them, IRS. So they uh, started a work group to consider tax and income issues after HHS brought an issue forward to ONDCP. 
Um, so the issue has to do with clinics and um, whether clinics will be uh, reporting income that uh, patients receive through a contingency management intervention. Uh, one thing that we learned that we probably all should know as Americans is that all income is taxable, um, but income over $599 re requires reporting using a 1099 form, uh, unless um, that income is considered exempt for, for certain reasons. And there are some exemptions in the tax code, uh, but interestingly, just, um, just being uh, a grant um, or provided by a grant is not necessarily an exclusion. Um, that our work group is going to be working also on the federal anti-kickback statute. I got heavily involved in this in the prior administration when there were some contingency management um, opportunities in some rulemaking. And, um, and we learned very quickly that uh, the rulemaking was simply too far along to consider um, consider the issues and to incorporate contingency management into that rulemaking. But some of that work um, has sort of um, been addressed in, in this administration um, in that we now have this work group and we'll be able to work on, um, on these issues. Next slide, please. So some of the actions that HHS is working on, they are focusing on reimbursement. They are looking at agency authority. For example, the question of does CMS have authority to fund CM programming? Uh, they are also looking at the question of incentive magnitude. Uh, as I'm sure you are aware, the California Section 1115 demonstration, also called the 1115 waiver, got approved for the beginning of 2022. And that essentially allows California Medicaid to, uh, to propose some programs that they might not ordinarily have authority to do and to demonstrate that those work. Uh, so California does have a CM project proposed and I know that um, Rick is in the position to um, provide more information about that. I think we'll be hearing about that later. Um, also, the Office of the Inspector General issued an advisory opinion that if you haven't read it yet, it is specific to um, one organization's contingency management protocol. Um, but if you haven't read it yet, I would recommend that you go ahead and take a look at it. And these slides will be available afterwards so you can take a look at it because it does neatly outline some of the policy issues in much more depth than I'm able to talk about them today. Okay, next slide, please. All right, the elephant in the room or the horse on the dining room table or whatever you, know, you wanna call it, the issue that doesn't get talked about nearly as much as it probably should and we have to address it is that CM is not scaled up, but it faces a challenge in the court of public opinion. And just anecdotally, I cannot tell you how many people I have explained CM to, and then they say, wait, that's messed up. Are you going to pay people to not use drugs? They should be not using drugs in the first place. And I come from a, um, a very behavioral background. Um, right before I came to ONDCP, Steve Higgins and Ken Silverman came down with our project officer and visited us at UAB um, because we were having problems with how our contingency management intervention was going. And, um, and uh, Ken Silverman and I had this wonderful conversation that sent me down a path um, related to, to animal training and, um, and clicker training and behavior analysis. And I, um, you know, have my own hobby where I, I work with this and um, with training my dogs. Um, and I very much see contingency management as a way to train people in new behavior, things they are not used to doing. Um, and, and so I just, I tell that to everyone here um, because, you know, that's what we, we need to get across, but it's hard to get across. 
Um, so, you know, here's a quote from the New York Times about Dr. DeFilippis told me that even in the VA, some people have difficulty with the idea. So this is something that we have had to educate people about and also that we're going to be continuing to need to educate people about if we're going to succeed in implementing this therapy. Next slide, please. So here are some stakeholder messaging ideas uh, to address the controversy. One thing is personal stories from counselors and patients. The blending initiative from the Clinical Trials Network uh, has a, um, a video, and I've used this video in classes that I've guest lectured in um, because you really see the difference that contingency management, especially uh, this was at Nancy Petrie's um, project where they use the prize closet, where people really get into the therapy, they get excited. And I think that that can illustrate very well to clinicians how well this can work. Um, there's also the importance of having support from well-known authorities. Uh, when Dr. Nora Volkoff talks, um, people have a tendency to, um, to listen to at least some of what she says. And I think her, um, her presentations and, and um, voice in the media can be extraordinarily helpful related to this. Um, making examples of other acceptable incentive structures, I think are important too. There's a whole science related to employment bonuses. Um, and um, so there's other areas where you can have an emphasis and, um, and then raising awareness of resistance to, to incentives as an example of stigma against people with the disease of addiction. I don't think that that, um, that hurts. And pointing out that increasing the number of people in recovery really benefits society as a whole is also important. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of um, personal stories from patients about making patients more accountable. I think that's a great, um, a great word to use and making them more responsible. Um, you know, and, and this example about not wanting to mess up their streak is, um, is something that I think will resonate with people. And, um, and actually, you know, helping a person actually be there when they said they were gonna be there um, for other people is important as well. And then for healthcare providers, getting people more engaged, getting them out in the community, reconnecting with family, et cetera, um, that resonates as well. Next slide, please. And the last thing that I want this group to really consider is that it is essential that programs implement CM faithfully that CM as a therapy will not fulfill its promise and patients will not benefit if we do not come up with a way to ensure that new programs that enter the space actually know what they're doing and implement properly. As I mentioned earlier, I needed Ken, we needed Ken Silverman and, um, and Steve Higgins to come down and tell us what we were doing wrong why we weren't getting what we needed out of our intervention. And, and part of it was sort of simple stuff, like we weren't informing the patients immediately about their urine testing results. And we weren't reinforcing as uh, close in time to people receiving their results as possible. Um, I have received calls about from clinics that are interested in doing this. And I don't think that as yet we have a very good um, implementation type of uh, system set up in place, um, whether that is, you know, some sort of organization that is funded um, to oversee how contingency management is implemented, or whether there's a, a website and a source that people can go to. Um, the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers is an example of a, um, a pretty successful way that they've been able to train in other um, cognitive therapy uh, or behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, um, and you know, perhaps a certificate program to provide additional reinforcement of 
of the lessons, but I think you get what I'm saying that we are going to really need to make sure that we implement faithfully and that there are good results from this therapy. Um, so that's, um, that's my, my main message. I think there's maybe one more slide. Um, yep. And, um, and that is it for me. Thank you very much. Doggy doggy. Time for us to go out for a little walk. So, because Cece's yeah, on Zoom, can yeah. we do her questions now? Let's go outside. Come on, Dougie. Oh, Cece, are you willing to take a few questions? My phone. I can take questions, but I was planning to stay for the, the um, QA session. Okay, so we're, then you'll be on. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So that was a perspective from the Office of National Drug Control Policy. We have another federal perspective that we're fortunate enough to have. And um, Dr. Evan Herman uh, is a program officer at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And until I read this bio, I didn't know that he was a, uh, uh, completed his PhD in behavioral pharmacology at the University of Vermont. I didn't know that. Um, and has uh, completed his training at Johns Hopkins and at Columbia and took a research faculty position at Columbia for a period of time. He's now a, a program officer in the Division of Therapeutics and Medical Consequences starting in April of 2020, where he administers a grant portfolio focused primarily on nicotine, tobacco-related experimental therapeutics and cessation intervention development. Uh, Dr. Herman. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I want to thank everyone for having me. It's real uh, great to feel like I make a, make a trip home for a few days, you know. So, uh, all right. So, what I'm going to do today is kind of give you guys an overview of the division, some funding opportunities, and what I'm trying to do is sort of weave in how I think CM still fits into the division's mission. Um, so, a little bit of background: the Division of Therapeutics and Medical Consequences was established in 1990. It was the Medications Development Division at the time. It was established, established as a result of a mandate from Congress that NIDA have an addiction medications development program. Um, the behavioral treatment development portion moved into DTMC in 2016. So DTMC kind of absorbed the behavioral therapies division. Um, so they're now, behavioral and pharma, pharmacological treatments are now in a single home. And our overall mission is to use science as a vehicle for improving treatment of drug addiction and its medical consequences, including HIV. So the, the division's organized into five branches, which are kind of sorted here um, in order from sort of the most basic science to the most applied. So the chemistry and pharmaceutics branch, medication discovery and toxicology branch, the clinical research grants branch, which is what I'm in, the clinical medical branch and a regulatory affairs branch. Now we all, we all work together, um, but I'm gonna give you guys some more detail about the clinical research grants branch, because I think that's probably most applicable to the type of uh, applications you guys would be submitting. Um, so we focus on phase one through three extramural research grants. So control clinical trials of new medications and clinical pharmacology studies of interactions among addiction medications and other medications and drugs of abuse. Um, over the last few years, there's been a lot of emphasis on um, studies on neuromodul neuromodulatory device-based treatments. Um, that's new. Uh, also behavioral intervention development studies. Uh, so target, so more basic early phase behavioral intervention development stuff like target identification work and, and phase two to three clinical trials of behavioral treatments. Um, over the last few years, we've also gotten really interested in digital therapeutics. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about digital therapeutics later. Um, so a little bit about our medication development program. So we're modeled at, the division is modeled after a typical pharmaceutical company everything from early phase testing all the way through regulatory affairs, uh, INDs, NDAs, et cetera. Um, and we support all phases of medications development for screening and synthesis of potential new drugs to these new drug applications. Um, the clinical research grants branch generally supports phase one to two investigator initiated studies targeting, targeting illicit drugs of abuse and nicotine. Um, so some of the medication development programs, high priority areas, or overdose prevention and treatment, treatment of neonatal withdrawal, 
facilitation of opioid agonist discontinuation, reduction in opioid-induced respiratory depression, and medications for the treatment of opioid stimulant cannabis and nicotine use disorders. So the first four are just sort of more specific targets that we have in mind. Um, so just to give you guys an example of some of the work we're funding. So this, this isn't a study that includes CM. I'm gonna go through a few that do include CM, but this is a medications development study, uh, randomized controlled trial looking at adding exenatide, which is a GLP-1 agonist used for the treatment of diabetes as an adjunct to nicotine patch for smoking cessation and prevention of post-cessation weight gain in smokers that are either overweight or pre-diabetic. So uh, uh, Luba Yamin at University of Texas is the PI on this one. So what's really interesting about this study and the reason why I think we found it attractive is that there's multiple potential benefits here. So there's some evidence that, that post-cessation weight gain or weight gain during a cessation attempt is related to relapse. So being able to block that weight gain may reduce relapse. Also, <clears throat> in many cases, you know, about a third of smokers who quit will gain 10, 15 pounds within a few months and they'll keep it on. And in many ways that weight gain may offset some of the health benefits of smoking. So you're not got the smoking, but you're 15 pounds heavier. I mean, that, that <clears throat> you're, you're um, mitigating some of the otherwise benefit you would get. Um, the third is it looks like exenatide seems to have some off-target effects in the CNS where it seems to disrupt the reinforcing effects of nicotine. So it may also act directly in the brain to help people quit smoking in addition to these weight-related reasons. Um, so what's what do I see as sort of the role of CM in, in DTMC's medications development research program? Um, I see it as a tool for medication adherence. So poor adherence has been endemic and really not only may lead to negative studies, it, undermi it, it undermines the internal validity of a lot of our phase two studies. So there have been hundreds of clinical trials of medications for stimulant use disorder, and almost all of them have been interpreted as negative. But in many cases, you know, the samples were small and the adherence rates were so low that you can't actually draw any conclusions from the results. Does it appear to be negative because the medication didn't work? Or is it because they didn't take a medication that actually does work? So, and CM has been shown to reliably increase medication adherence. This has been a lot of work done with HIV antiretrovirals that's really well cited. Uh, Jim Sorison's group, one of the, one of the folks that do that. Um, but I don't think there's been enough careful application to controlled clinical medication trials to make sure that you're going to be able to produce high enough rates of adherence to see if the medication produces a signal. If adherence is really an issue because of, you know, potential lack of reinforcing effects of the medication or some side effects, that can shake out in the phase three. The purpose of the phase two is, is target engagement and to see if you can get a signal. Um, this can be adapted to be used with some of our new biomarkers. So one long acting urinary biomarker that's new, acetazolamide, something that NIDA has worked on developing. Uh, one of the POs in, in my branch, Aiden Hampson, has worked on that one. And there's also been, I think, development of remote monitoring methods. Um, so if there's a way that, even if it's just as a consulting role, to have some CM experts working with folks that are doing med development to try and develop these schedules and methods for ensuring high medication adherence off the bat, so we don't have to wait till we're halfway through the trial and realize adherence is an issue. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiasm for that. I think there's less enthusiasm for studies combining medication with CM for drug abstinence. So these are just a, a few funding opportunities in medications development. So you see these are all UG3, U, UG3, UH3, or U01 awards. So the way U's work is unlike an R, they're cooperative agreements where you have more involvement from program staff. So in addition to a program officer, you'll be assigned a science officer, and the science officer will work with the PI um, on various aspects of the research. The level of involvement depends on the PI's needs and what unique expertise the science officer can contribute. So they may be heavily involved in, in study design, manuscript preparation, data analysis, all that, or it may be sort of more of an advisory role. Um, and you can see we're particularly interested in opioid and stimulant use disorders right now. So within the clinical research grants branch, there's also the behavioral and integrative treatment development program. 
the director is Will Aiklin. Um, the goals of this program are, are to produce efficacious behavioral treatments for substance use disorders, produce treatments that are implementable in the real world and have the potential to be self-sustaining, and to develop optimal behavioral strategies to promote medication and SUD treatment adherence. So this, this program supports stage one to three research. So we tend to like to break things down into this. So the stage one to three sort of parallels the phase one to three of drug development because our division's primarily focused on drug development. We tend to like to frame everything in that, in that context because looking at it in a stage kind of gives you an idea of how far away this treatment is for, for patients, right? So when you're looking at the potential of a treatment to enact change and reach folks, it's not only how efficacious it may be or may not be, but at what stage of development it is, you can think about how far off it is from potentially reaching patients. So here's this promising stage one treatment, but that's probably still seven to nine years away from potentially ever being used in a clinic. Or here's a stage three treatment. Okay, that's only four years away. So we can start getting more excited about that one. Um, so stage one encompasses all activities related to the creation of new behavioral interventions or modification, adaption, or refinement of an existing intervention, as well as early feasibility and pilot testing. Uh, stage two is essentially your, your early efficacy trials in research settings with research therapists and providers maintaining a high level of control. So analogous to your phase two experimental therapeutics, clinical trial of medication. Um, stage three is studying interventions in community settings with community therapists and providers. I'd encourage folks when, if they're putting in applications um, or they're, when they're maybe talking to Will about putting in applications in the behavior, for the behavioral integrative treatment development program to really frame things in where you think your stage of research is, because it sort of helps us appreciate it where it fits in the pipeline of all these interventions that are under development. So some high priority areas uh, in the behavioral integrative treatment development program, research to elucidate some mechanisms of action and targets for behavioral interventions research examining novel behavioral targets in the context of intervention development, and research that uses innovative technologies, so things like mobile applications, wireless monitoring, biofeedback, and imaging to develop and improve and measure interventions. Right now, I think we are really bullish on the technology-related stuff, just because it has the potential for having much wider reach than, than a lot of traditional setting interventions. So, Here's a, one study that we're currently funding, and it's in the Behavioral and Integrative Treatment Development Program. It's on reward-based technology to improve opioid use sort of treatment initiation after an ED visit. So essentially, they're examining to see what the effect would be of adding CM to an existing opioid use disorder-focused patient mobile application. So this is recruiting patients right from an ED visit to that disorder, and they're trying to reinforce early behaviors, things like scheduling your appointment, going to it, and then the first four weeks of Suboxone. And within this study, they're doing a they're doing an N equals 20 proof of concept study, and then an N of 150 RCT within this R42 application, comparing the CM plus mobile app versus this mobile app alone versus usual care. So th this app has already been well developed and and validated. So really, adding a CM component to bridge what's a really critical juncture is getting folks from that ED visit where they present with an overdose no bite, or just Good girl. have an OUD it gets no, detected, no actually getting into treatment and starting down, it. Down, 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 down. So down, here's a down. couple of behavioral treatment funding opportunities. So we have an R01 and an R34. I think most, most folks are familiar with the R01. I don't know about the R34 though. So the R34 is basically a beefed up R21. It's three years and four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars because it seems like for for clinical research, the R twenty-one budgets are are really tough to work with to be able to do anything on an R twenty-one budget. So we think the R thirty-four is generally really good for as a preparatory mechanism for a future R one. Also, a, a notice of special interest that I'm the contact on about oh, I'm, uh, uh, using telemedicine and remote-based treatments. Uh, for substance use disorders, use this of, uh, branches like, behavioral and pharmacological and treatments. And, uh, it's not specific to any, whether something's um, a digital therapeutic, or maybe just the mobile app, or using telemed, which you could use reinforcement with. Um, so, so it's broader. Um, so that, that might be a good fit for folks if they're interested in things that are technology-based. 
So we're, we're also really interested in digital therapeutics. So digital therapeutics differ from other technology-based platforms or mobile apps because they're, they necessitate their clinical grade software programs that can that can that are designed to prevent, manage, and treat a medical disorder or disease. So these are distinct from a wellness app or or other types of apps. What I think the biggest distinction is though is that these things can be reviewed or authorized by the FDA. And the NIDA and FDA established a partnership in 2019 where we had a sort of a memor memorandum of understanding where they'll provide we can both work together to provide guidance to grant applicants to help them navigate the FDA submission and authorization process, accelerate the progression and accelerate the progression of these technologies through the regulatory pathway. I think the reason why we're really interested in digital therapeutics is these can become something that a doctor can prescribe and they can be CNS authorized and insurance could pay for them. And those are the types of treatments that really end up having broad reach in our medical system, right? Things a doctor can prescribe and that insurance can pay for. So some priority areas for the development of digital therapeutics. Uh, so we, we would like to see projects that have a clear goal of FDA authorization or clear dissemination plans, projects that are testing interventions with known or hypothesized mechanisms of actions to be validated as part of the research. So because we're experimental therapeutics focused, we don't want to only know if it works. We want to kind of know how it works because in that way, the research is also sort of probing the etiology of the disorder. So what you learn from the results isn't just a conclusion of whether or not the intervention works. It's the role of the hypothesized target process in the disorder is something you also learn about. Um, we're also interested in projects targeting poly substance abuse or addressing trajectories of substance use. So this is another digital therapeutics type app. app. This is um, a study by Bethany, Bethany Rafes, the PI on looking at um, personalized non-monetary smartphone-based rewards for smoking cessation. So it, it basically, the, the app basically limits participants' access to high-valued apps until they have delivered objectified evidence of smoking abstinence. Preliminary testing uh, is being done in a sample of 50 treatment-seeking smokers and um, primary outcomes and feasibility and preliminary efficacy. So this is a, one of the R34s that's under that um, Behavioral Integrative Treatment Development Program, um, F FOA. So, yeah, we, we do have a UG3UH3 specific for digital therapeutics for substance use disorders. So the way a UG3UH3 works is the staged reward. There's a two-year UG3 phase and a three-year UH3 phase that are linked by a set of milestones. Um, so what they sort of enable, enable you to do is sort of compress a beefed up R21 and a mini R01 for a project into a single application where whether or not you progress from the first phase to the second phase is contingent on programmatic review of whether or not you have met your milestones from the first phase. So, and you also have, because it's a cooperative agreement, you have a science officer who's involved um, who'll be helping you out and you'll have program oversight. Um, so the, this is sort of a new mechanism that, that we just got really big on in the last three or four years. Um, and I think it's it, it's really cool if you're if you don't mind having some program involvement in your research and you want to get a lot done in a five year time period, um, I think these are great mechanisms. So in summary, uh, DTMT's focus on the development of treatments for substance use disorders. Um, the vast majority of our focus is probably on, well, the majority is on medications, um, but we also focus on devices, behavioral therapies, and digital therapeutics. And, you know, I want, hope I successfully highlighted a couple opportunities to integrate CM um, into DTMC funded projects. Um, yeah. Thank you. Calling you back up in a minute. Thanks to Dr. Herman for the overview from uh, NIDA. So we've now heard from two of our federal leadership organizations and um, now for something different. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you were living in Vermont during 2020 and 2021? 
Okay, well, for the, those of you who raise your hand, the next speaker is someone that you saw, it seemed like almost every day for a while on, on the TV with standing next to the governor. Um, uh, Dr. Levine really has, uh, I, I was, uh, he and I communicate by email occasionally, and he always answers my emails right away, and I think, how could he possibly be answering my email? He's got to be the busiest guy in, in America. But um, it, you'd be driving around listening to NPR, and Dr. Uh, uh, Governor Scott's news conference was on, and at least three quarters of the questions were to Dr. Levine about the COVID epidemic. I was amazed with the level of detail he knew about COVID, the, 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 uh, the new treatments, the de vaccine development and all of that. I mean, Vermont was incredibly fortunate. I don't know in 2017 when you took the job, if you could have ever pictured what was in front of you over the next two years, but uh, we're very grateful and very honored to have Dr. Mark Levine to talk to us uh, a bit about the topic of contingency management from the perspective of the state of Vermont. Uh, Dr. Levine is a professor at the University of Vermont, was a very renowned and honored teacher in the medical school. Um, you can read uh, that information in the bio. He obtained his bachelor's degree at the University of Connecticut, his MD at the University of Rochester, and his internal residency in, here at the University of Vermont. Um, I really uh, am honored to be able to uh, introduce you. I'm uh, one of your one of your fans. So, uh, Dr. Levine. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I hope I'm not giving anybody PTSD by being up here, because uh, the pandemic is over, right? Uh, and I do answer your emails because any distraction from COVID was like the most welcome thing in the world. And it continues to be. Uh, so you can see on the slide what we're gonna talk about. And those are my objectives to talk about smoking and other substance misuse uh, with contingency management, uh, but to really do weave in some public health principles and um, practices, if you will, I'm not going to define contingency management because if you haven't been paying attention to this point in the conference, something's very wrong. But I do want to uh, really make the point that, you know, if you look at the mission statement of the Vermont Department of Health, it's to protect and promote the best health for all Vermonters. And so we truly believe in that, as you'll see in some ensuing slides, but that also applies to what particular substance is being used. And um, as you can see, there is evidence in a wide variety of substances in this world of substance use that we have an entire division devoted to, uh, two divisions devoted to really in our health department. We all know quit lines have efficacy in smoking cessation. So that's not a startling re re revelation by any means. Um, but research has uh, assessed the use of incentives um, among quit lines. Um, you know, some of them use biometric types of validation, um, whether it be, um, you know, urine testing, saliva, what have you. Um, but there are other studies that look at non um, validated, if you will, more process outcome measures. Um, but overall, no matter what way you look at this, as you can see on the slide, providing incentives will increase the rates of smoking cessation. Now, as I stated at the outset, we really do um, want to look at this from the standpoint of multiple populations. Uh, because generally we are at the health department and hopefully in society focused on the most disadvantaged populations much of the time where we see the highest rates of issues. But basically effectiveness of quit line incentives has been shown for populations defined by socioeconomic status, by pregnancy status, 
by presence or absence of mental health problems or by race and ethnicity. And as you can see, um, the cost effectiveness of quitline promotions is increased by use of incentives. And one study is demonstrated on the slide, but that's not a study in isolation by any means. So I promised a little more public health and um, we have a state health improvement plan, which is called the SHIP. And basically that's a five-year plan for the health department. Um, a little aside, it got a little distracted in the last few years. Uh, there were other issues and we had sort of all hands on deck with this pandemic. But the reality is um, the entire state health improvement plan is built on a foundation of health equity. And that's really important. So just to define health equity for you, it's ensuring that all Vermonters have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy. And that's of course, especially if you've experienced socioeconomic disadvantage, historical injustice, other avoidable systemic uh, inequalities. The diagram does a nice job of demonstrating equality which means all of those individuals get the same bicycle for transportation versus really looking at this with an equity lens where depending on your size, you'll get the appropriate sized transportation mode. Depending on disability status, that will be taken into account, et cetera. So clearly, you know, the priority populations are always defined by race, ethnicity, um, gender orientation, disability status, socioeconomic status, et cetera. And when you look at our four priority areas, which the social determinants of health are added to in this list, uh, you can see that when we're talking about substance use, nicotine, et cetera, uh, we're covering most of these areas, you know, certainly substance use disorder and childhood development, but very much so mental health, prevention of chronic disease, and there's lots of oral health issues with many substances as well. Uh, so this really, uh, I guess a trifecta would be three of these. I don't know what a quint, quintfecta would be. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about the use of incentives with the quit line. So clearly we have our own quit line and since not everybody here is from Vermont, it's 802, which is our area code quits. Um, and it uses incentives, but again, doesn't have the biovalidation component at this point in time, whether we're talking about carbon monoxide, saliva, urine testing, what have you. Um, now, historically it's already offered uh, incentives for the pregnant population, but looking with the equity lens that we just did, uh, in 2021, uh, the Tobacco Control Program launched several new protocols which changed these incentives and increased things in the pregnant and postpartum states to a $250 level. We also started to pay more attention to the um, socioeconomically disadvantaged population um, and offered up to $150 per participant. These were mostly gift card kind of uh, interventions. Um, so obviously you do something like this to engage people more with the quit line. And um, the goal would be increased engagement um, as an outcome measure, if you will. And we know that the more you stick with something like this um, and with each quit attempt, you're going to basically uh, enhance your ability to sustain uh, your likelihood of quitting. You may look at these dollars and I'm not sure how this audience looks at these dollars. You know, and it's like, boy, this is really generous or this is really stingy. But the reality is, I'm told these are the highest of all states. So, hooray Vermont, um, your tax money. No. Uh, so let's look a little more closely at this. Um, 
if we look over the course of about a year from 21 to 22, there were 818 registrants. Now, the chart provides an overview for the numbers uh, with no incentive versus incentive. Amazingly to me, and still a bit inexplicably, 56% did not accept incentives. Um, but that does leave the entire rest of the group that did. Uh, so we have 33% in the Medicaid population and much smaller percents in the menthol and pregnant populations. If you look at these populations, if you received incentives, you were generally somebody who smoked more cigarettes per day and smoked more of the time, as these two bar graphs show, uh, somewhat subtly, but uh, clearly there is that predisposition in the incentive group. Looking at completion of coaching sessions as an important outcome for the same time frame that we've just been talking about, we can see that the first coaching session shows the most impact from the use of incentives, with 41% of those in the incentive group completing the first call compared to 29% in the non-incentive group. If you look at the remaining number of calls, there's a very slight increase with the use of incentives. But when you get down to uh, five coaching sessions, there's a higher percentage of incentivized registrants, 21%, compared to only 9% of registrants without incentives who um, completed those sessions. And the, if you gain a higher completion of the first call, uh, we as a state might be able to serve more Vermonters who otherwise might not be uh, participating or have completed a coaching session. With even a small increase in completion of coaching sessions among those in the tailored protocols using incentives, it's possible we'll see increased but uh, quit attempts among those quit line um, registrants. While this isn't the ultimate, kind of contingency management exercise. Again, um, doesn't have that hard outcome of a bio kind of uh, abstinence uh, measure. Uh, I would consider it still an important surrogate outcome, if you will. And the program's also looking at new options uh, for text quitting online support that would provide some kind of a monitoring like carbon monoxide monitoring and increase the level of uh, financial rewards. Because the challenges do not end. If you look at Vermont's rate of smoking compared to the national rate during pregnancy, and unfortunately I have to be uh, humble about this, in many substances use rates during pregnancy, Vermont is unfortunately out in front. We're generally really, really healthy state and we do well on all measures. But in this area, we continue to have issues. But focusing just on the smoking, uh, obviously we can't look at statistics like that and not do anything about it. So the tobacco control program had been looking for novel ways to support smoking cessation in the pregnant and postpartum states uh, to complement what's offering use uh, by the quit line. Um, so we used uh, partners in Rutland and UVM uh, to apply contingency management in a community setting. So this is um, using, again, stuff you've heard already in this conference from Dr. Higgins uh, regarding those kinds of smoking cessation contingency management programs. Um, we piloted a study and uh, funded a study for three years to assess the feasibility of translating this uh, contingency management UVM program uh, into a rural community setting, housed with clinical and community partners in Rutland. So I call this translational research and really sort of, if you will, bench to bedside, bench to uh, clinical room uh, and a kind of operationalization of this outside of a research setting. 
So the community was prepared uh, in terms of the five A's. Are people familiar with those? Um, from that's historic uh, at this point in time already, and we're provided with the appropriate scripts to use. Um, they were nervous about it, um, and you know you have to remember these are settings where you know people aren't generally getting smoking cessation advice. So it's a little bit of a lift, a heavy lift to uh, add this to the menu of things. As a primary care physician, I know what it's like to have something added to the list of what you need to accomplish at any point in time. Um, but the protocol uh, using contingency management strategies was adapted for use in two types of community settings clinical and community health. So the pregnant women were recruited from our WIC program, which is women, infants, and children, which you may be familiar with, and from the Rutland Women's Healthcare, which is the only OBGYN practice in Rutland County. Uh, the women got in-person counseling during scheduled meetings, which could go up to 36 total sessions, and they received gift cards throughout pregnancy and three months postpartum, contingent on the biochemical verification of their abstinence. And adherence monitoring began with high frequency and tapered through the postpartum period. So if you look at some results, as I mentioned, people were very worried about high caseloads and how stressful this may be for the practices, out of about 256 births to Rutland during the two years of the study uh, of women who smoked, 20 women were enrolled and five of these were also opioid dependent. So the feasibility and the doability of the project became much easier because they were not dealing with huge numbers. And um, this became really what I would call a demonstration or a pilot project. Um, and there were a total of six women who quit, two of whom were opioid dependent, as you can see. Uh, and, and the six women who quit earned an average of $418 in gift cards, plus uh, some baby supplies as well. Um, they got incentivized to have that first sit down meeting to discuss the project before they even enrolled. And um, obviously one of the challenges was we did have this thing called the pandemic and uh, it's right during the same time period. So engaging people and sustaining their um, interest and uh, reliability during that entire time. Uh, but adaptations were made like doing some of the sessions in parking lots. Um, so that was a challenge needless to say. Um, and though everyone received the appropriate training to work with the women, uh, changes in clinical workflows and in staff, uh, confidence to engage women uh, were challenges as well during that time. But if you look at the blue dots, you know, that's uh, Rutland County's experience, and there were some bumps in the road with regard to staff and regard to pandemic and all of that. But the, real, the, the end result is that you can see that the cessation rates in Rutland had improved dramatically from where they were just a couple years prior. So obviously we learned a bunch of lessons from this in terms of uh, the trainings that would be needed to boost the confidence of the staff who were delivering the smoking cessation um, advice and uh, engagement. Um, there were issues about um, incentivizing quitting and smoking reduction. Consider a hybrid approach with community and clinical settings supported by something like a smartphone application. And indeed, uh, there is something going on now with the idea of smartphone application addressing transportation barriers, which in a rural state um, are always very, very significant. We actually list rurality as one of those equity issues. Uh, and we have data from abundant settings that shows that rurality alone can determine 
quality of outcomes in things uh, as serious as getting chemotherapy for newly diagnosed cancer. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the next couple slides because I believe Steve did present a lot on this yesterday, but the reality is uh, pregnant Medicaid members who receive incentives are six times more likely to quit smoking than those who use just best practices alone. Uh, so we should certainly continue to look for ways to use contingency management in our patient care and community settings, uh, like the WIC offices that the previous example illustrated. Obviously, there are well-known benefits of smoking cessation in pregnancy. Um, and the flip side of this is look at the harms that come with regard to being born small for gestational age, having pregnancy complications, or God forbid, infant death, uh, the cost of labor and delivery, the lifetime risk of smoking-related disease in the mother, uh, and then, of course, secondhand smoke in the household. All of these become benefits when this is successful. And the benefits come with an incredible uh, return on investment of almost 12 times, which I also believe was uh, discussed yesterday. And um, that's work with Dr. Shepard. And uh, I will move on to the next part so I can get through the rest of my talk. I want to pivot from the tobacco world to the uh, long list of other substances. And uh, I will highlight the actual treatment setting and the so-called treatment court. What we're going to discuss is how we utilize contingency management in not only opioid use disorder, but also other substances like stimulants in our drug treatment programs and in our treatment courts, and how these again can not always have to be monetary. There can be other incentives that qualify for the definition of contingency management, even if they're not directly providing uh, a payment of some sort. So the concept of treatment courts uh, needs to be explained a little bit, uh, but it's just what it says. So it's uh, very much tailor-made for people who have high recidivism rates, significant substance use treatment needs, as you might imagine, there are many uh, anticipated as well as unanticipated contacts between those with substance use disorder and our legal system, our law enforcement and judicial system. And um, most of the time, our goal is to make sure we can redirect people away from the enforcement option and into a treatment option, knowing we're dealing with a uh, disorder that um, has been driving them in the wrong way to end up being connected with law enforcement. So these are most often uh, one-year kind of experiences with intensive problem-solving court process that involves a lot of judicial hearings. If you look at uh, what goes on in treatment courts and what we can uh, due to improve the experience for someone, um, we basically find that there's a lot of opportunity to engage people and help them to be successful. And um, there's sort of a cascading engagement in care, along with um, decrease in intensity with time and based on success. So the primary incentives for participants would be significant reductions in convictions, like going from a felony count to a misdemeanor count, or eliminating clinical, uh, sorry, criminal conviction uh, with successful completion of the treatment court process. So these are clearly uh, very important incentives for someone to have. You can see that Non-monetary awards include this sort of a lowest level positive feedback and affirmations, 
but as we move sort of up the ladder, uh, reductions in structure, which would include things like frequency of court appearances, frequency of toxicology testing. And this would all be based on ongoing treatment adherence, achieving and maintaining abstinence from substance use, and of course, absence of firm, further criminal behavior. That doesn't mean that those should be the only incentives. And of course, there can be prize-based awards. Um, they can start with things like bracelets, um, positive affirmations, move on to bus passes, move on to movie passes, or something even more valuable over time. But it's a gradation of increase, if you will. Moving from the court setting to the hub setting, I think most people in the room are aware of what our hub and spoke system is like in Vermont, but hubs are basically uh, places where people uh, with uh, sub, well, specialists with addiction medicine credentials are present. And the clientele would be people who need a higher intensity of attention. So they would typically be on daily methadone dosing, or if they're on buprenorphine, they would be in a much more intensive outpatient environment for that. Uh, so it's tailored to their needs. So if we look at what goes on in hubs, if you have a stereotype in your mind, it's probably of a place where people go every day, have to show up at a certain time, have to be in a line, have to uh, have a connection with people there, uh, in terms of uh, perhaps testing and perhaps counseling, et cetera. Uh, and it can take up a lot of a day. Now, testament to many of our uh, people in Vermont who have substance use disorder, we've done so much to try to work to reintegrate them into society and have them have something to look forward to every day. So many get employment. Um, and you can imagine uh, getting to your place of employment is a priority for you, but so is getting to the hub and making sure that you can have an arrangement where somebody can actually live a life, but keep their obligation up to the management of their substance use disorder. So various uh, non-prize contingencies are actually feasible and plausible and work in this setting. Uh, and the pandemic, one of those silver lining things again, uh, showed us that actually there's uh, a lot more trust that can be garnered in this process with this population and providing more ways for them to avoid at that time contact with other human beings because of the pandemic, but also continue to have stability in their management of their substance use disorder. So there are things like uh, having take-home doses, so you don't have to show up every day of the week. Obviously, that can increase over time, and it's dependent on the stability at a certain level. Um, primary target, obviously, is toxicology testing that would remain negative. Um, and then depending on if you're on methadone or buprenorphine, uh, there would be various protocols that people can follow to actually not have to show up seven days a week. There can also be what are called fast passes. Uh, so if you are one of those people who need to get in and out and get to your job, a premier parking spot, uh, earlier dosing in the day, uh, ways to uh, incentivize you and allow you to live your life and you get multiple benefits uh, from that. And then the last thing I'm gonna show you is just uh, what we do uh, now with our colleagues at Brown University. Um, raise your hand. Oh, our colleague at Brown University. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is what I would call, and you can help me if I'm wrong, implementation science. So we've talked a little bit about translational research and bench to bedside. And in our first speaker's talk, you heard a little bit about the challenges of implementation. So here is implementation science alive and well. Um, basically an eight week intervention, uh, again, taking place in Rutland. 
uh, in Project MIMIC, Maximizing Implementation of Motivational Incentives in Clinic. So basically, uh, fishbowl design, so you fish out your um, piece of paper with your incentive. You don't start the minute you arrive. You have somebody who has been inducted into therapy, has had a period where they can be stabilized. But then, for example, during weeks three to 11 for an eight-week program, um, you implement uh, the MIMIC kind of project. Um, and that is a gradation of prize draws as well over time, uh, where they may be very small in the beginning and then get to extra large, as you can see on the slide, something fairly substantial uh, with time. With the primary outcome being 90% of individuals enrolled under contingency management condition complete the intervention duration. So that's going on real time um, and addresses the issue of how do health systems make this actually happen, which is critical. So I know we'll have more time to discuss all this in the Q&A, uh, but that's the uh, end of my presentation from the public health perspective. Thanks for your attention. Dr. Henry, could you come up? Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, and Dr. Herman will come up and we have uh, CC on Zoom for questions for the first three speakers. Uh, and if you could speak to the microphone, that would be uh, very helpful. Dr. McDonald. I have a question. Um, I have a question for Cece. Hi, Cece, it's Mike McDonald from Washington State. I don't know if you're here for uh, Kate Hershack's. Thank you all for the wonderful talks um, about the great things that are happening in Vermont and that night and, and that you're doing for advocating, advocating, especially for this to get out in the real world. So I don't know if you were at Kate Hershack's talk yesterday about our work in native communities, but I just wanted to ask is, uh, is uh, is Indian Health Services involved in any of the discussions you guys you all are having? So um, the Indian Health Service is part of the HHS work group, to the best of my knowledge. Um, I will say that we've been looking at specific exemptions in the tax code related to um, you know whether or not people can be taxed for certain things. And I believe that both the VA and Indian Health Service have exceptions in the tax code. And I will go back and confirm that um, for, um, for funds that are, are given to, um, to those groups, um, that those do not necessarily require taxation, um, because that's, um, that's important. And also, um, recently, I have, um, I have an intern here who has been working on going through um, the different abstracts of the um, SOAR grants and the TOR grants, um, the Tribal Opioid Response Grants, which also allow um, treatment for methamphetamine use disorder. And there are a number of tribes that have proposed DM interventions um, within those, those abstracts. I don't know if that's everybody, but there's quite a bit of interest. Um, so uh, yes, um, there's, there's definite engagement of IHS. And, um, and I will um, get back to you about, um, about the exception. And uh, I'll send that to, um, I think, to Rick or Rick and Steve um, for IHS. But I believe it's the VA and IHS that already have mm -hmm. exceptions regarding taxation um, for this. Great, Cece. Thank you. Thank you. Steve. Hi. Um, I, I just want to commend all three speakers. I, I think each of the presentations was, was just excellent. I really like Dr. Spitzna's and Herman giving us links, um, which we can, these, um, presentations get recorded and will be available on the BCBH website. So if you want to find one of these links, uh, please go. But I think that stuff is is very um, helpful to us out in the field. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Herman, one of our graduates, proud of this, to see you at NIDA. And um, I think it's, it's, you have an, in, uh, an opportunity along with Dr. Aikland to have a tremendously positive influence given your training in behavioral pharmacology. Um, but I'm gonna take advantage of you being one of our guys and, and I, wanna, I wanna push back a little bit on this idea, I have to admit, I take a little personally, of developing treatments that can be implemented in a current system. It has face validity. It sounds like a great idea. And I'm sure it's not your, you know, it's coming as a policy level within NIDA. But I always thought that um, R01 should allow you to dream. The current system is not good. <laughs> if we stay in the current system, we're gonna remain pretty ineffective. Um, so where it's personal is we, del we deliver the uh, vouchers plus CRA treatment model for cocaine. And um, Dr. Leshner, the current, the, night, the director of NIDA at the time, to his credit, he tried to disseminate. He gave us funding to write manuals. And he went out to, and he and his colleagues to, to states throughout the, the country it was not well received. They didn't like the treatment. They said we couldn't do the treatment. And do I have regret? Well, a little. I could have done better anticipating dissemination. Bill Miller at the time was working on motivational interviewing. His is very well disseminated and adopted. Doesn't work that well with people who have severe dependence, people I was interested in. Do I have regrets of developing CM for psychomotor stimulant use, use disorder? 30 years later, the only treatment in controlled trials that works. So the good message, I, that's a little bit of carping, but it is my, my reality, at least. That's what I've witnessed. Um, but taking back, you know, what I, the CRA plus vouchers treatment shows what can work. And so there should be opportunities for people to develop existing clinical structures to accommodate things like vocational training, relationship training, things that have efficacy that most current clinics don't do. So take the message back, please, Evan. <laughs> uh, other questions? To piggyback off of that uh, comment, thank you, Steve. That was very enlightening. Um, I'm an addiction medicine clinician. And I'm curious to hear, uh, we have all this evidence that CM works, and it's exciting hearing about this project Mimic, about utilizing implementation science to move contingency management into the real world. And I'm curious to hear from all of the panelists, are you aware of the best mechanisms for funding this sort of implementation science work? It sounds like we know that CM is the best we have gold standard therapy for stimulant use disorders, and yet we're not seeing this treatment implemented in the real world. So I'm curious to hear if you have any recommendations uh, for funding mechanisms to implement this evidence-based treatment. I guess I can go. So also just to sort of back up to my statement, I'm, I'm talking about, what I was talking about was from the position of the Division of Therapeutics and Medical Consequences, not NIDA as a whole. So we do have another div division called DESPER, it's more impl implementation science focused. Um, I would encourage anyone who's interested in implementation work to reach out to folks at Desper or um, reach out to me. Uh, if you have these slides, I have my email and um, basically I can plug you in with the right person to talk to. Oh, can you tell us what, what's the definition of Desper? What does it stand for? Uh, epidemiology and services research. Okay. And epidemiology. So Sarah Becker, that's where your grant is, is from? Okay, so Implementation Science Division. Yeah, so I'm gonna to talk to you all soon, so I won't spend too much time, um, but DESPER funds R01s, P's, U's, um, R21s, R34s, all in health services. And I would say throughout the HEAL initiative, there have been a ton of RFAs focused on implementation science. I personally have had a P50, a R01 and a UTC all focused on implementation science. Um, so it's a very hospitable mechanism and place to be. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, to follow up Steve's uh, comment, 
As you'll hear from Tom Fries this afternoon in the implementation of what we're doing in California, I can tell you when you actually go out to implement contingency management in a large state system, hundreds of providers, there are about 500 questions that we have to answer that we don't have answers for, that we have to kind of make it up as we go along. And we would love to have some data to guide some of these decisions. And so I think there, I, I sent your boss an email about the need for there being a, a whole new generation of contingency management research, not implementation research, but questions about if you're gonna use contingency management in the real world to address the public health problem of stimulant use disorder, for example, how long should the protocols be? Uh, how often should you do the testing? Uh, what should the incentive levels be? Uh, should we have higher incentive levels at the beginning to draw people into treatment and a more gradual escalation? Or should we go with the protocols that we have now? There's a bazillion questions that we don't have data to support. And I, I do think there was a period of time at NIDA where it was sort of like, well, we've had all this CM research. We don't really need to do any more CM research. We know it works. Well, knowing it works and knowing how to do it in the real world are two different things. And we, we still need a whole new generation of research. So I would ask you to take that, that message back too. We, 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 not, we also need that research in the medication world. Like, common question, how long should, the, should a person be on methadone, be on buprenorphine? Um, and it's tailored to individuals, obviously, but many individuals are trying to direct their own course as well. And we don't have a lot of data to provide them. I, I, am I allowed to ask a question? Sure. Somebody else yeah. in the panel? Because uh, I was intrigued by uh, our first speaker's discussion, um, which uh, was on stigma. And the reality is, um, is contingency management suffering from that, if you will, and how do we get out of that rut? Uh, so, you know, the way we got out of the rut with getting substance use disorder recognized as what it is, not a failing or a weakness in an individual, but an actual chemical disease, a chronic medical condition, is we actually focused on the brain and brain chemistry. Now, there is brain chemistry involved in contingency management, and we're talking about reward pathways, incentives. We're talking about replacing current behaviors with other behaviors that may still feed the part of the brain that requires that nourishment. Um, is there a way for us to focus back on the brain and reduce the stigma that might be associated with contingency management uh, at the same time? So um, I think that's a question for me, and I did want to respond to um, the original question also. Um, I think that the, the VA foundation and um, possibly even CDC may be in a position to address some of these implementation science issues. Um, but, you know, I, I feel very strongly that um, we need to start implementing and then learning from our mistakes and, and iterating. And again, having some sort of resource so that clinics can reach out to the experts in this field and say, it's not going real well with my um, patients, we're not getting the results we thought we would get, what can we do? Um, I think that something like that would be extremely helpful or to have, you know, programs set up from the get-go so that they, um, they really adhere to the principles of CM. I also want to say that, um, you know, stage three behavioral therapy um, development programs, um, I was, you know, a program official working with that program previously. Um, implementation science is, uh, you know, fit in there, um, but you have to have the buy-in from the institute director that they're interested in funding, um, funding projects on this topic, 
And I think that uh, Dr. Levine's point is an excellent one. One of the questions that we don't have an answer to is how does or does, and we say all the time that it does, how does CM motivate new behavior? Is it motivating new behavior and how does that work? Do we have brain images of, of that really happening? I go out and I say, yes, you know, it, it does um, seem to get people active and activated, but we don't have that, um, that science, I don't think, we don't have any neuroimaging showing that doing this treatment makes a change. I think it would be extraordinarily helpful and I would recommend that you speak with um, somebody at NIDA and they ensure you that there will be interest in your application if you, if you submit it, um, that, that there will be you know, some interest from the top in funding it because that is, um, is really essential. And I can't speak for Dr. Bokoff about what she's interested in, in funding. Um, but I would suggest that people consider that um, as a as a possible project. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we have an online question from Cassie O'Hara for Dr. Spitzos. Uh, you mentioned increasing advocacy to address issues with public opinion. I'm wondering your thoughts on who will be, be best heard by relevant stakeholders. What do you see as the role of scientists? I think the scientists are extremely important. And unfortunately, I mean, my, like I said, with my background, um, I didn't really have a lot of training on how to engage um, with a policy community. And there are people though that, that uh, are experts in this. And one group, I don't know if they're represented there today. Um, one group that I think um, could be really, really helpful as American Psychological Association um, because of their, um, you know, their experience with um, advocacy, both with the VA and veterans and a variety of different, um, different uh, congressional um, committees. So I, I think that, you know, I would be talking to American Psych Psychological Association um, if I were out there in the field about how to do some of this public policy work. Um, I think that the speaker the other day, yesterday, um, who spoke about um, the policies at the state level um, and, and model state laws um, also was onto something because if you construct model state laws, um, and uh, actually ONDCP does have a grantee called um, the Legislative and Public Policy Analysis um, Organization, uh, they make model state laws. If you make a model state law and then states begin to work in this area, um, that can be a strategy for, um, you know, for driving change and, and policy, and especially, you know, working on reimbursement in your state. Um, one thing that I don't think people think about too much is, um, it's been my experience Pete, that CMS doesn't necessarily like to authorize um, reimbursement for something that hasn't been tested in a Medicare population. Um, and a lot of our interventions have not necessarily been tested in Medicare population. Um, so, you know, that's another, um, just another pointer um, to consider, you know, having one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and also bringing patients who, or people with lived experience who have benefited um, to be able to directly tell their story. Uh, thank you. Last comment from Dr. Levine. Uh, just to piggyback on that, you know, we're talking about tobacco use, we're talking about substance use disorders. I mean, these are ginormous public health problems. Um, and uh, public health can be very successful at being advocates for this and working closely with legislatures and executive branches in the states. Uh, just pre-pandemic, we were so concerned about vaping in our youth and we passed three laws 
all of which we advanced in public health and supported at the legislature to raise the tobacco usage to 21, to put uh, identical penalties on use of um, vaping compared to combustible cigarettes and prevent some of the internet workarounds that youth were, were having. So uh, the reality is um, public health brings the science to the table and brings the actual statewide, not just national, but statewide data, even sometimes region-wide data, um, and can be very effective teaming with the scientific community. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our speakers. Uh, thank you. Uh, Please see and we take a break. We now have a 15 minute break before the next session.